Welcome back, folks. Today we're going to be mixing things up a little bit, and we're going to be going over the Elf Ancestry. I've been meaning to make a video like this for a while now, so I hope that it's helpful for anyone looking to play as an Elf. I'm just going to be putting this out front that I will not be covering many of the physical or cultural features of Elven society in this video. I know that not a lot of people play in Galarian, so Galarian specific lore might not be helpful, and you should also be free to describe your elf however you want. Plus, if you're at all familiar with fantasy stories, you're almost certainly familiar with elves, and yeah, Galarian elves are pretty much normal elves, with some few interesting distinctions. They live a long time, they're graceful and intelligent, and they're, well, elves. Either way, I'll be covering elves in three parts in this video. First, the basic features of all elves that everyone shares. Second, the different heritages that elves can gain access to, and you get one of those at level 1. I won't be going over all of the versatile heritages, as each of those deserve a video of their own. Finally, I will be going over all of the ancestry feats that you can choose. Settle down and go grab some snacks if you want, and let's get down to business. Let's start by covering some of the simpler features that all elves get access to. You get a total of 6 hit points from your Ancestry, which is unfortunately the minimum amount that an Ancestry can give you. Elves aren't often physically sturdy, but you do get some other really nice benefits. Elves are medium sized, which is standard, and they also have a standard speed of 30 feet. This is huge, considering that almost all races have a base speed of 25 feet or lower, meaning that that additional 5 feet of movement can help you get out of so many different situations, whether that be positioning into a different, more advantageous position in melee combat, ducking behind cover, or even just for calculating your overland travel speed. Maneuverability should never be underestimated. Moving on just a little bit, uh, as anyone who has read or watched the Twin Towers from Lord of the Rings can tell you, elves have good eyes. In mechanical terms, elves have low light vision, which allows them to see just as well in dim light as if it was in bright light. This means that they can ignore a lot of concealment that other races might have to deal with. Finally, all elves know common and elven. If your intelligence modifier is positive, then you can choose an additional amount of languages you know equal to your intelligence modifier from the list of Celestial, Draconic, Null, Gnomish, Goblin, Orcish, Sylvan, and any other language that would make sense for your character to know depending on the region that they're in. Also, while it isn't a mechanical trait, do keep in mind that elves can live for a very, very long time, and certain feats or abilities can only be taken by elves of a certain age as those abilities or feats represent an accumulation of knowledge over a very long time. The last part of the basic features that all elves get access to is their ability score boosts and flaws. All elven characters get a boost to dexterity and intelligence at level 1, along with a free ability boost that can be put into anything but dexterity and intelligence, no double dipping. Unfortunately though, elves also do suffer from a constitution flaw. This flaw, when combined with only having 6 hit points from your ancestry, will really, really not help your total hit points, and I really suggest putting that free ability boost that you get into constitution, as that will help make up for this flaw. Every character needs constitution. But thankfully, most classes can benefit from having a good dexterity or intelligence. Dexterity is great for almost every single type of martial, and no spellcaster is going to be upset about having a good dexterity. And intelligence means that elves often make really great wizards or witches or basically any character that cares about intelligence at all. Overall, the elven ability scores are great for characters that need dex or intelligence, but your hit points and fortitude saves will always be a bit behind pretty much any other character. This is always going to be manageable though, and you can certainly deal with it. Don't let the name fool you, as the ancient elf heritage isn't just for old crotchety elves. It requires that you're at least a hundred years old, which by elven standards is just that you're an adult. The benefits of being an ancient elf are incredible, as it gives you a multi-class dedication even though you're level 1. 
This generally represents some kind of training that you've had years and years and years ago, and it's a great way to expand your, your options at level 1 and can help give you some mechanical bite to the flavor in your backstory. While it is perfectly fine to just say that your elven champion was raised as a priest, it gives a bit more significance to it if you also have a cleric dedication giving you access to some of the cleric abilities, so you literally are a priest. Also, ask your GM if they're alright with you taking normal archetype dedications rather than just taking multi-class dedications. I don't think that it's overly powerful as long as they are level 2 dedications, but it's definitely not allowed rules as written, but it does allow you to really get some interesting character concepts going from level 1, like say grabbing an archaeologist dedication. That's not going to break the game, but it might fit with your backstory better than a multi-class dedication would. Elves are generally in tune with nature. And the Arctic Elf Heritage is the first of a series of heritages that are basically dependent on where you grew up. If your character grew up in a cold environment, then the Arctic Elf Heritage fits great and gives you a lot of really nice thematic abilities. First, you get cold resistance equal to half your level, minimum one, and you also treat environmental cold effects as if they were one step less extreme. The resistance to cold damage is nice, even though it isn't all that high, because it will always be there. Every single time you take cold damage, you will be reducing it, which will probably end up to be a lot of cold damage over the course of your character. While cold isn't the most common damage type in the game, being able to reduce it whenever it comes up, it will always be nice. The additional effect of being able to survive in dangerously cold environments better than anyone else is situational by nature, as you might not be running into those types of environments very often. But in the right type of campaign, or in the right type of campaign setting, this can be absurdly powerful. The Cavern Elf heritage is fairly simple. Due to being born underground, or your family coming from the underground, you get dark vision. Dark Vision is incredibly powerful, even if it isn't too flashy of an ability. It's always going to be better to have Dark Vision than to not have it, so you really can't go wrong by being a Cavern Elf. Additionally, if you're ever planning on being sneaky in the dark, having Dark Vision is almost a must, considering that nothing gives you away faster whenever you're hiding in the dark than carrying a lantern. The Desert Elf Heritage is the other side of the coin that the Arctic Elf Heritage is on, giving you resistance equal to half your level minimum 1 to fire damage and reducing the effect of hot environments rather than cold environments. This is even better than the Arctic Elf Heritage in my mind, since fire damage is the most common elemental damage type in the entire game. You're going to run into fire damage a lot more than cold damage, which makes the little bit of resistance you get go much further. Also. Being better at taking environmental heat effects and being able to function in those environments is situationally incredibly, incredibly strong, just like with the Arctic Elf Heritage. So maybe ask your GM how, how often you're going to be in those types of environments. The Seer Elf is fascinating, as it's a great way to give a martial character some really generic but useful magical ability, or to enhance the pre-existing magical ability of a spellcaster. You get the ability to cast the Detect Magic cantrip at will, which heightens as normal for a cantrip. On top of that, you get a plus one bonus to identify magic and to decipher magical writing. This is a set of fantastic benefits, as Detect Magic is one of the most generally useful cantrips in the entire game. And flat bonuses on checks to identify magic and decipher writing are generally pretty rare. For a martial character, it's a great way to be able to not have to rely on your allies to find magic and identify it, and for spellcasters, it means that you don't actually have to ever learn detect magic or memorize it every day, effectively giving you another cantrip every day because pretty much every spellcaster worth their salt is probably going to be pairing detect magic. I can't think of a situation where you would ever not want to have detect magic, and the bonus to identify magic will just make identifying magic items a lot easier, and it will, you know, reduce the chance of you accidentally putting on a cursed item without realizing it. 
The Whisper Elf might be one of the most generic elf heritages, but that is in no way a bad thing. Your ears are incredibly sensitive to the smallest of noises, which makes you way better at finding creatures that are hiding. Whenever you use the seek action to try and find undetected creatures, rather than seeking in a 30-foot cone in one direction, you seek in a 60-foot cone. Additionally, whenever you are trying to find a creature that is within 30 feet of you that you could hear, you get a plus two circumstance bonus on your perception check. This is incredible since finding hiding enemies can completely change how fights end up working. Whenever a creature is hiding, it will generally draw out an encounter or allow them to use an ability that they can only do whenever they're unnoticed or undetected. Going from a 30-foot cone to a 60-foot cone is a huge, huge increase in area that basically more than doubles the amount of area that you can look at a single time. The cherry on top is that plus two circumstance bonus, which makes you even better at finding creatures who are nearby. This is going to work on almost all creature types, since pretty much everything makes noise and you only get that plus two circumstance bonus against creatures that make noise. But really, think off the top of your head. What kind of creature is incapable of making noise? These benefits do only work when trying to find creatures though, so you aren't as good at finding objects or secret doors, as those generally don't make noise. There are two benefits to being a woodland elf, and both are strong in forest terrain especially. Unfortunately, they don't give you all that much outside of forest terrain, so I really recommend talking to your GM about whether or not you'll be in forest terrain a lot in the game before you decide to be a woodland elf, as it doesn't feel great to never be able to use your heritage bonus because you never go into a forest. The first benefit is a great, great boost to your maneuverability, as you can climb trees and other foliage way better. You move at half speed on a success and full speed on a critical success, and if you ever get the quick climb skill feat, then you can move at full speed on just a normal success. This is a huge, huge increase to the speed at which you can climb, even if it is limited to a particular part of the environment, but it can really help out whenever you need it. If you are a woodland elf, I really recommend it, at the very least being trained in athletics, because otherwise your increased climb speed isn't going to matter as much since you are less likely to succeed or could succeed in the first place. The final benefit is a great boost to your survivability, as it allows you to always be able to take cover for a single action in a forested terrain. Even if you aren't near anything to take cover behind, you just blend into the forest and it's harder to see you. This means that you can spend a action to get a bonus to AC and reflex saves anywhere in a forest, and then you can use another action if you want to try and hide using self. This is an incredible boost in the right situation to your survivability, and it is a great way to just live longer if you have an action that you don't know what to do with. Also, rogues are going to just love being able to take cover and then hide anywhere. It's amazing. The Ancestral Linguistics feat is a really interesting kind of feat, especially for more studious characters or in games with a lot of research. You can only take it if you're at least 100 years old, but then during your daily preparation, you can think back to old memories to become fluent in a common language of your choice or any other language that you have access to. This is a temporary effect, meaning that you can't use this knowledge to serve as a prerequisite for more permanent effects. The main drawback of this feat, but also benefit of it in a way, is that it requires you to think ahead to get full use out of it. But if you can predict what you're going to be running into, then it will be very, very useful. If you know that you're going to be running into a particular group of people, then you can just think back to, you know, like 200 years ago whenever you spent a couple semesters learning the language. In the right situation, knowing a language can make a huge difference. Ancestral Longevity is pretty similar to Ancestral Linguistics in that it can give you a temporary trained proficiency in a single skill. You have to be at least 100 years old to be able to take the feat, but it's a great way of improving your versatility, since you can now be trained in any skill as long as you plan ahead of time, and you choose this trained skill every morning whenever you do your daily preparations. 
Also, you should ask your GM if it's alright for you to pick a lore skill with this feat, as lore skills are generally very situationally powerful, but if you think you're going to be in a situation where you could use a lore skill, then it is really nice to be able to grab it. If, say, you know you're going to be running up against a werewolf or other very specific type of creature, then you could maybe grab lore were creature to maybe get some more information if you have to roll on it. Even if you can't grab a lore skill, then this is still fantastic, because being trained in any skill of your choice any day gives you an incredible amount of versatility. The Demon Bane Warrior feat from the Boagi Expanse book is rather interesting and rather specific. It's all about you slaughtering demons. You get a bonus on all of your damage rolls with weapons and unarmed attacks against demons equal to the number of weapon damage dice that you're rolling, and that increases by a further plus two if any of your actions make the demon take damage from their sin vulnerability. If you didn't know, every demon has a particular way that they can take damage based off of a particular action that is antithetical to their being. This is fantastic if you know that you're going to be fighting a lot of demons. But if you don't fight a lot of demons, then this can't benefit you in any other way. If you know that your GM likes to plan out campaigns long in advance, then I recommend asking them if you're going to be fighting a lot of demons. And if you aren't, then maybe ask if maybe you could if you really want to play a demon fighting warrior. If you do end up fighting a lot of demons and you end up taking the demon bane warrior feat, then I really think that it can be very, very good, especially if you're playing a character that makes a lot of attacks in the same round, like a monk or maybe a flurry ranger, as then you'll be getting the most out of the bonus on every single attack that you make. Almost all elves are in tune with nature, and elves who take the elemental wrath feat are definitely in tune with their surroundings. Upon taking this feat, you choose either acid, cold, electricity, or fire. You can now cast the Acid Splash Cantrip as a primal spell at will, except that it deals whichever damage type you chose whenever you chose this feat, and it also has that tag rather than acid. Additionally, it only has verbal components rather than having a verbal and a somatic component, though it still takes two actions. This is great as it allows you to be able to cast the spell without provoking any attacks of opportunity, unless it's a special attack of opportunity that can be used against verbal actions. This is a great way to be able to add some variety to your damage dealing in case you run into something that's resistant to physical damage, because now you can do some elemental damage on top of that. Though keep in mind that Acid Splash is one of the cantrips that does not scale very well as it gets heightened. Also, splash damage can actually hurt yourself and allies depending on how you're positioned, so if you're in melee you might want to be careful. Elven Aloofness is a rather specific feat. You've come to terms with how quick-tempered and rash non-elves are, so you just aren't as threatened by them. Whenever a non-elf gets a failure when trying to coerce you using intimidation, they get a critical failure instead. Additionally, whenever a non-elf attempts to demoralize you, you're temporarily immune for one day rather than ten minutes. My issue with this feat is that I think it will hardly ever actually be that useful. I don't think that all that many GMs actually roll Intimidate when they're trying to coerce the party into doing something, and almost no GMs tell the party, you feel coerced into doing what this person is saying because I rolled Intimidate. Coercion just doesn't come up that much normally from the GM side of things, it's more often a player action rather than an NPC action. So the first benefit of Elven Aloofness just isn't all that useful, and I don't think it would have ever come up in a game that I've played in. The bonus to your temporary immunity against Demoralize is also very, very situational, as how often do you actually fight the same enemy in the same day? It's not very often, so the increase to your temporary immunity isn't that great. Normally, if you fight something, you probably kill it or neutralize it, and you don't end up fighting it again in that same day where the temporary immunity would really matter. Overall, Elven Aloofness feels more like a character trait that you roleplay rather than a feat that you take. Every ancestry has a lore feat that you can take that gives you train proficiency in three skills. For elves, those skills are Arcana, Nature, and Elven Lore. 
all of these skills can be very useful, since nature and arcana can be used for all kinds of things and can allow you to roll for knowledge checks on a lot of different types of creatures. How much you use elven lore will depend a lot on your game, since it depends so much on your setting. If you're exploring a lot of ancient elf ruins, then this will be a lot more useful than if you're in an area where there are basically no elves around. Also, if you get a training in any of these skills from any other place, you can get training in another skill. So if you're a wizard and you're automatically trained in Arcana, you can just pick another skill so you don't lose a train skill. Elven Verve is another rather specific feat that gives you a plus one circumstance bonus to saves against effects that give you the immobilized, paralyzed, or slowed conditions. Also, if you would have any of those effects for at least two rounds, you reduce the number of rounds by one. This is very, very situational, but whenever those effects do pop up, you definitely don't want to have them, so a plus one bonus on saves against them would be pretty nice. Unfortunately, though, a lot of the times that you would get the immobilized condition, it's either an attack roll made against you, or just a skill check against one of your skill DCs to be grabbed. It's up to you whether or not you want to take Elven Verve, considering that it will likely come up infrequently throughout a campaign, but it could be pretty useful whenever it does come up. It's up to you whether or not you want to take a feat that might only be useful every once in a while. Elven Weapon Familiarity is an incredibly interesting feat due to the weapons that it affects, and it can really change up the way that you want to build your character. You become trained in longbows, composite longbows, long swords, rapiers, shortbows, and composite shortbows. This is mostly useful for classes that aren't trained in all simple and martial weapons, like say rogues and pretty much every single caster, as now you get access to all different types of weapons that you might not otherwise. A wizard who is trained in a shortbow all of a sudden has another way to use their third action after they cast a spell, which greatly opens up their actions. They might not be the most accurate character in the world, but it's still an additional attack roll and it could certainly be useful. The second effect gives you access to all uncommon elf weapons, and also any martial elf weapon counts as a simple weapon, and all advanced elf weapons count as martial weapons. There aren't any advanced elf weapons actually, but being able to count the martial ones as simple really helps out for classes like, say, rogues, as now they can actually get all of their trained proficiency in them. There are four elf weapons that this gives you access to. The Elven Branch Spear, the Elven Curved Blade, the Mithril Tree, and the Three Peak Tree. The Mithril Tree and the Three Peak Tree are both firearms, while the Three Peak Tree is also a trident. They're both long-ranged weapons that also have the parry trait, which is really interesting for people that get up close to you, so it is really nice for a character that wants to use a firearm. In my eyes, though, the real stars of the show are the Elven Branch Spear and the Elven Curve Blade. The Elven Branch Spear is one of the only finesse weapons with reach in the entire game, and it's probably one of the only ones that has both the deadly trait and not the non-lethal trait. So yeah, now you can use a reach weapon that has finesse, and it's basically just a rapier but it's really long, which is amazing. The Elven Curve Blade is also a finesse weapon, but it also has the distinction of the highest damage die that any finesse weapon has access to. Both are fantastic options for rogues due to them being finesse, and also are fantastic options for swashbucklers. Basically, they're fantastic options for any character that wants to use a finesse weapon. Elves get access to basically the best finesse weapons in the entire game, if I'm being honest, and this feat is what you need to take to get access to them. Forlorn is a simple feat, with a very, very sad reason behind it. Due to watching other friends age and die over and over and over again due to your long lifespan, you get a plus one circumstance bonus on saves against emotion effects because you've gotten used to having really crappy emotions. If you roll a success on one of these saves against an emotion effect, you get a critical success instead. This is incredible since emotion effects are often common and really powerful. Now you can turn your existential crisis 
of missing your loved ones into something really useful, and it can really help protect yourself against a lot of really powerful effects. Know Your Own is such a specific feat that I'm having a hard time thinking of a character that would actually take it. If you do, you are so well studied on elves specifically that if you critically fail a check to recall knowledge about elves, elven society, or elven history, you get a failure instead. I don't know how often you'll be making a knowledge check about something that specific in the first place, let alone how often you'll actually be critically failing. I like the idea of this feat flavor-wise, but it's so dependent on you having to make these checks really frequently to get a good bonus out of it. Also, if you want to be good at these types of checks, then you can just take the elven lore feat, which will help you get these checks by being able to use elven lore. So this is just so specific that I don't know how often anyone really, really want to take it. It's up to you if you want to, though. Nimble Elf is the simplest elf feat by far. You get an additional 5 feet to your speed, officially making you the fastest that basically any character can be at level 1. This also stacks with the fleet feat, which means that elves can be really, really fast. Now, I mentioned earlier in this video in the basic features section that you shouldn't look down on having a plus 5 foot bonus to your speed, especially since you'll be faster than basically anyone else. Nimble Elf just makes that advantage larger, and never underestimate the power of maneuverability. The otherworldly magic feat simply gives you access to one arcane cantrip that you can cast every day. You are going to be using Charisma as your spellcasting ability as normal for innate spells, so do keep that in mind, because in all likelihood your attack rolls and spell DCs won't be actually all that high, because you don't get an innate bonus to Charisma, you get that to Intelligence. But if you are going to be increasing your Charisma a lot, you can make some really good use out of this. If you're looking for damage, Electric Arc is probably the best arcane cantrip for damage, but Detect Magic, Message, Precedentation, and Shield are fantastic utility spells that you will get a lot of use out of. Share Thoughts is a rather weird feat that comes from some very specific regions of Galarian, so it, it works in really unusual ways. Once per day, you can use the Mind Link spell as an innate occult spell, but you can only use this spell on elves or other half-elves. If you're in a party with another elf or a half-elf, then this might see some use, but otherwise it won't be nearly as useful. Being able to share 10 minutes worth of information with someone is nice, but I don't know if restricting it to elves or half-elves will make a lot of people want to take this feat, unless you're in an all-elf party. Unwavering Mind is for elves you want their mind to be a fortress. Whenever you're affected by a mental effect that lasts for at least two rounds, you can reduce the duration by one round. This is really useful for some mental effects, although it is not useful at all for others, since some mental effects will last for literally days at a time, so reducing that by six seconds doesn't make a huge, huge difference. But there are some mental effects that this will be incredibly, incredibly useful for. Additionally, you become resistant to any effect that would put you to sleep. You get to treat your save as one degree better against any effect with the sleep trait. This sounds a lot better than it is though, unfortunately, as hardly any effects actually have the sleep trait. Like, it's basically pretty much just two spells. Overall, Unwavering Mind does help a lot if you want to become more resistant to mental effects, even if it won't help as much in every scenario. Wildborn Magic is very similar to the otherworldly magic feat, as it allows you to get a single cantrip, but this time it's from the primal list. Everything that I said about otherworldly magic carries over to wildborn magic, so I won't waste both of our time going over all of that again. Woodcraft makes you the king of the survival skill in forest and jungles, even though its benefits don't help anywhere else. Whenever you're in those environments, if you roll a critical failure when sensing direction, subsisting, or covering your tracks, you get a failure instead of a critical failure. If you get a normal success, 
then instead you get a critical success. This makes you way, way better at actually getting around in forests, as you basically can't get lost anymore. If your campaign has a lot of exploration elements and it takes place in a forest, then this can be a very, very valuable feat. Ageless Patience is a fascinating feat that can make you a lot better at finding pretty much anything as long as you have the time. It can also help you with any skill check. You can voluntarily double the amount of time that you take on a perception check or a skill check, and then you get a plus two circumstance bonus on the result of the roll. Also, natural ones no longer make the result of a roll worse if the total is at least higher than 10 or than the DC like normal, so you could only critically fail if you're 10 or below the DC. This can be super useful for certain skills, though for other skills it might not actually have any effect. If you wouldn't actually get any benefit for taking your time with it, you can't actually use Age's Patience on it. For example, it's great for medicine if you have the time to spend to spend double the amount of time patching up people's wounds to make sure you're going over everything correctly. But if you're trying to roll acrobatics to tumble through an enemy creature, taking double the amount of time isn't going to help you out on that. If you aren't in a time crunch, then this can be very helpful, but do keep in mind that sometimes it won't always be better to take your time. The Ancestral Suspicion feat is rather specific, but in those situations where it is useful, it is very, very powerful. And those situations might not be common, but when they come up, you really, really want to make sure that you succeed on those checks. You have seen so many civilizations rise and fall that you're wary of others who might seek to manipulate you getting a plus two circumstance bonus to saving throws against effects that would give you the controlled condition, and to perception checks to sense motive to determine whether or not another creature is being controlled by someone else. Also, if you roll a success on one of these rolls, then you get a critical success instead. This is really great in campaigns where you know you're going to be fighting against particularly types of enemies. As an example, if you're going up against Algolthus, which are aquatic monsters with powerful mind control powers, then this can see a lot of use. The Golthus were called Apolis in previous edition, if that helps you get an inkling of what you'll be getting into. Basically, if you're going to be fighting a lot of people with enchantment magic and mind control effects, then Ancestral Suspicion is a fantastic feat. Speaking of El Golthus, here's a feat that specifically calls them out due to how much you hate them and their mind controlling magic. It is uncommon and it comes from a very specific region of Galarian, but it has a really interesting effect, so if you're outside of Galarian, then you can just, I don't know, it's up to the GM whether or not this is available. You've trained yourself so thoroughly on how to resist mind-affecting magic that you're almost willing to die rather than to be controlled. If you start your turn confused, controlled, or fleeing, and you got that effect from failing a will save, you can attempt another will save against the same DC. If you succeed, then you're paralyzed for that turn, denying whoever affected you their desired effect. Now, you can resist being controlled to hurt your allies by limiting your body to freeze up. Also, you can do this check every single turn. So depending on what the DC is, there's a good chance that you're going to be paralyzed over half the time that you're being controlled. Elven Instincts is a pretty general sort of feat, but it is rather good. You get a plus two circumstance bonus on perception checks that are made as initiative rolls, and regardless of what you actually roll for initiative, if you tie with anyone, then you go first. Normally monsters go first on ties with initiative, or you have to roll off if you're, you know, deciding to do it that way, but now it is definitively stated that you go first. It might not happen all that often, but when it does come up, it can be really significant on how the combat starts. The bonus on perception checks for initiative is also great since perception is the default option and a lot of classes and a lot of characters will just want to go with that regardless. If you do take Elven Reflexes, then you can also avoid taking the incredible initiative feat for the most part since you already have a bonus to initiative as long as it's perception. Elven Weapon Elegance requires the Elven Weapon Familiarity feat, but it then upgrades that feat to give your attacks with all the weapons that that applies to their critical weapon specialization effect. 
this can be pretty useful, but many classes will get these critical effects naturally as part of their class. So for any class that is trained in all simple or martial weapons, then you don't quite get a lot out of this. Forest Stealth is another interesting feat that requires that you are in a forest or a jungle, in addition to requiring that you're an expert in stealth. So it's a little bit specific about the environment that you're going to be in, but there are enough of those that this isn't that much of a surprise by this point. For one action, you can take cover and then immediately hide, which is, frankly, insane action economy. Taking cover gives you a bonus to your AC and to your reflex saves, which will certainly be helpful if your check to hide doesn't work. And if it does work, which has a good chance due to you having the cover bonus to your stealth check, then you are also hidden, which is a fantastic way to improve your survivability. This is a really fantastic feat for a ranged rogue, though it is only useful in forests, so your mileage may vary. Ask your GM, again, how fun are we going to be in a forest this campaign? Because that will make a significant impact on how useful this feat is. Martial experience is an interesting feat, since it can give you training in all kinds of weapons. Whenever you take this feat and use a weapon that you're untrained in, you use your level as your proficiency bonus, and at level 11 you become trained in all weapons, regardless of what group they're in or what proficiency they have. This is pretty good, but most martial characters are already trained in simple and martial weapons, so this is mainly for characters with very limited proficiencies who, or who are only trained in simple weapons. But at that point, you could just take the weapon proficiency general feat to become trained in all kinds of martial weapons. This is only really useful if you're going to be using advanced weapons, which it depends on you a lot if you actually are going to be doing that. Overall, martial experience is great for situations where you have no idea or control over what weapons you're going to be using, but if you're generally going to be sticking with one type of weapon, then it isn't nearly as useful. The Wildborn Adept feat gives you access to three primal spells, Dancing Lights, Disrupt Undead, and the Tanglefoot Cantrip. Before you can take Wildborn Adept, you also do have to take the Wildborn Magic feat, but you know, this feat and that feat do stack, so you'll have access to a total of four extra primal cantrips by this point. Also, all of these cantrips can be rather useful, so getting access to them is great. Dancing Lights can help out anyone of the party who, you know, doesn't have dark vision. Disrupt Undead is fantastic for killing undead, and Tanglefoot is really useful for people who are trying to run away. To get the best use out of Disrupt Undead and Tanglefoot, though, I'd really do recommend having a decent charisma to boost up your save DC and your attack rolls. I will never complain about getting access to more cantrips every day, so really this is fantastic. Brightness Seeker is a weird feat from the character guide that allows you to cast Augury once per day by studying your surroundings. If you didn't know, Augury is a divination spell that allows you to try and predict how a particular course of action will go that you can complete in the next 30 minutes. You spend 10 minutes, and then you get a result of Wheel if the results are good, Woe if the results are bad, Wheel and Woe if they're mixed, and nothing if nothing particular bad or good will happen. Also, there's a slight chance that you'll get nothing regardless of the actual potential results, based off of a secret DC-6 flat check. The augury that you get from Brightness Seeker is a little bit different though, as for the next 30 minutes after you use that augury, you can spend a reaction called Call Upon the Brightness. You can use it whenever you attempt an attack roll, a skill check, or saving throw while performing the course of action from your augury, but you have to decide to use it before you roll. If you do use it, then you get a plus one status bonus on the roll, or a plus two if the result of the augury was woe, but you decided to go through with the action anyway. The real power of this feat is that the reaction can be used every single round, meaning that you can use it every single round of a fight if you want. You just have to predict to use the augury ahead of time. Also, if you know that you're about to go into a super challenging fight where you will need this, the odds of you getting a nothing on your augury are pretty low because, in all likelihood, you're going into a dangerous encounter, where where the result of an augury is probably not going to be that nothing is about to happen. It's probably either going to be you're about to steamroll the encounter, or it's going to be really rough, which is 
probably going to be wheel or woe or wheel and woe. Elf Step is a very simple feat, but it is very powerful. As a single action, you can step twice. I really recommend taking the Feather Step general feat if you plan on taking this, because being able to step into difficult terrain makes the ability to step twice even better. As I've said multiple times throughout this video, never underestimate mobility options. Being able to move 10 feet away from someone without provoking any reactions is fantastic. Expert Longevity is a really weird feat that has effects that I've never seen anywhere else in the entire game. It is an upgrade to the Ancestral Longevity feat, and it allows you to choose a different skill that you were already trained in, that now becomes a temporary expert skill. Additionally, here's the weird part, at the end of the day, whenever the effect ends from both Ancestral Longevity and Expert Longevity, you can retrain a skill increase, though the skill increase must be moved into a skill that you were already selecting with Ancestral Longevity and Expert Longevity. This basically allows you to move around your skill increases over a couple of days to fit whatever you want although you cannot move around one to be a master in an easer and skill. This is really weird, but it basically allows you to, over a couple of days, to say, yeah, I'm now permanently an expert in Arcana, even though I was untrained two days ago. This is really weird and it's great for being a jack of all trades, but do keep in mind that if you pick any skill feats, you do continue to have to satisfy those to be able to use them. So maybe don't retrain your skill increases in those particular skills because you don't want to lose your skill feats. Those take a lot longer to retrain. Continuing the theme of elves having a special connection to magic, the Otherworldly Acumen feat gives you a second level spell slot every single day that you can cast. You can only take this feat if you already have at least one innate spell from an elf feat, and the second level spells, tradition, depends on the tradition of the innate spell that you have had previously. Keep in mind this specifies elf feet, so getting the tech magic from the seer elf heritage does not technically count, but ask your GM if it does. There are a ton of great second level spells that work really well even at higher levels, so you really don't have that many bad choices. I recommend choosing a utility spell personally because that will always be useful, whether that's a buff or just something to help you get around. Also with a day of downtime, you can change up this spell into a different common second level spell of the same tradition, so don't get too caught up on your decision because you can always change it. Speaking of innate spells, the Sense Thought feat extends the thought magic that you get from Share Thoughts at level 1 by allowing you to cast Mind Reading once per day. Mind Reading is an interesting feat that allows you to get surface level thoughts from a target, all along with being able to understand if their intelligence is higher or lower than your own. It's not really a spell meant for combat, but being able to read people's minds is always going to be a really interesting ability, even if it is a little bit creepy to have someone poking around in your head. So it's a great, great feat with a lot of really interesting roleplay elements to it. Tree Climber is a simple feat that sounds like it will have similar effects to the Woodland Elf heritage, but it's not exactly the same and it doesn't even require being a Woodland Elf. Due to spending so much time climbing around trees and being in the canopy, you get a 10 foot climb speed. This is pretty good even if the climb speed is a bit low. It might not be useful a lot in combats, especially because you're getting to a level now where flight becomes a pretty realistic option, but out of combat it will simplify things a lot. Even in combat, sometimes a 10 foot climb speed can be very impactful, but it might not be most of the time because that is a pretty slow climb speed, but it is still always better to have a climb speed than to not have one. At level 13, Avenge Ally is a feat that you really, really hope that you won't be using all that much. You can only use it whenever you're next to a ally with a dying condition, but then you can use an action to roll twice and take the better on a strike against any creature that you can make a strike against. If you've watched my video on the Swashbuckler or the Unexpected Sharpshooter, then you'll know my thoughts on the fortune tree and being able to roll twice. It's hugely impactful and is a 
great, great bonus to your roll, and Avenge Ally is justifiably limited to being used once every 10 minutes. It can be a great way to turn a bad situation into a slightly better situation. Elven Weapon Expertise is a deceptively simple feat, making it so whenever you get a boost to your proficiency with any weapons, your proficiency with longbows, composite longbows, long swords, rapiers, shortbows, composite shortbows, and all elf weapons increases to the same level. This is especially fantastic for fighters, since normally at level 13 they would only be legendary in one group of weapons. If they take elven weapon expertise though, then they will now have legendary proficiency with all of the weapons that I previously mentioned. So at least a couple of bows, a couple of swords, one spear, and two firearms that they will now be legendary in. That's a really great increase to uh, your versatility, and it can be useful for other classes, but it is mainly to get your weapons up to par with your normal proficiency. Universal Longevity is the final part of the feat tree of Ancestral Longevity and Expert Longevity, and it makes you even more adaptable with your skills. Now, once a day is a single action, you can change the skills that you selected with Ancestral Longevity and Expert Longevity, allowing you to change up what skills you have on the fly if something more relevant than what you expected comes up. It's a nice boost to your versatility, and it means that you will never be useless when it comes to skills. To really go over Wandering Heart, you have to recall back to the Heritages section of this video, as there were a set of four heritages that were based on adapting to a particular environment. Arctic Elf, Cavern Elf, Desert Elf, and Woodland Elf. You can only take the Wandering Heart feat if you belong to one of those four heritages, and it allows your heritage to actually naturally change as your environment does. Now, once you spend a week in an environment that is associated with an elf heritage, your heritage will naturally change to the one that is actually representative of that environment. So if you spend a week in the Arctic, you become an Arctic elf. This can't change your heritage into one that is not associated with the environment though, so you can't get access to the ancient elf as an example. The main issue with the Arctic Elf, Desert Elf, Woodland Elf is their benefits are not nearly as useful outside of their particular environments, so Wandering Heart vastly improves the power of these heritages by basically ensuring that you will always have them when you need them. It is a bit of a shame that you have to wait a week to get the actual change, but considering how you're basically changing your body's physiology, I think that it's pretty understandable. Magic Rider is the only level 17 elf feat, and its effectiveness purely depends on your GM. Elves in the Galarian lore are masters of teleportation magic, and now you can tap into a bit of that power. Whenever you're the target of a teleportation spell that moves more than one person, it can affect an additional person because effectively it's so easy to move you with teleportation that you don't count. Also, whenever you're the target of a teleport spell, like the specific teleport spell, you and all the other targets arrive no further than one mile away from where you intended to go, no matter how far you traveled. The reason why I say that the mileage of this feat varies depending on your GM is because the only teleportation spell that is common that can move more than one person is Collective Transposition which allows the caster to move around allies, meaning that now a total of three allies can be moved rather than two. This means that if you aren't allowed any uncommon spells, this level 17 feat will only boost one specific spell if your GM doesn't allow you to grab the other teleportation spells. By level 17, I imagine that you'll be able to get your hands on teleportation magic, since uncommon normally means that that magic does exist, it's just kind of hard to find. By level 17, finding something like that shouldn't be too unreasonably hard, but that call is technically up to your GM. The boost to your accuracy of the teleport is also really appreciated if you can get access to it though, as as you heighten teleport, you run the risk of being up to 100 miles off mark, which can really set back your travel plans. Overall, the Elf Ancestry is really interesting and has a lot of interesting 
downsides and a lot of benefits. They get so many interesting feats that really can interact with all aspects of how Pathfinders play. They're not just like all combat ancestry or all roleplay. They have a ton of different feats that can really satisfy a lot of different niches. There are lots of feats that have great ideas for roleplay or really give you a lot of incentive to roleplay out situations. And they also have some great abilities that encourage you to use downtime or exploration activities. But they also have a ton of feats that boost your combat effectiveness or give you access to all different types of abilities. A set of weapons that you can get access to using the line of elven weapon familiarity feats are fantastic, and there aren't all that many feats that I would say are just straight up bad. I'm being completely honest when I say this. I think that you can make a very effective character of any class with an elf. And I love that that's true, because that wasn't true in necessarily in previous editions. Also, I feel like I should say this at some point, but pick whatever you feel is best representative of the character that you want to play. Ancestry feats are not going to make or break your character, so pick whatever you think is going to be fun for you to play at your table. If your ancestry feat is not going to determine whether or not your character is dead weight or if they're going to be weak or strong. It might, you know, push you a little bit further into the territory of being strong, but it's not going to make your character quote unquote bad. Pick whatever you think it will be fun for you to play as. It's a game. Have fun with it. Thanks for watching. This has been a really interesting video to make, since ancestries are in a very different design space as the rest of Pathfinder. They're a lot more focused on flavor over mechanics, which could make my job of making a guide a bit harder to do. But I've really enjoyed the challenge. If you've got any thoughts that you'd like me to see, whether that be pretty much anything, then I'd appreciate a comment down below. If you liked what you have seen today, then I'd really appreciate it if you could either like or subscribe down below, because really any kind of engagement will boost how much people see my videos. Until I see you next, live a wonderful life.